Yes, we are. We are live. Okay, so welcome everybody to this live broadcast on Facebook's uh, Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association's Facebook page. I am going to just give a little announcement and then we're going to begin. Um, this broadcast will also be used in our Tales from the Heart podcast, so you can look forward to that being uh, available in about a week. It is currently September 10th at uh, about 3 o'clock Eastern Time. I'm not quite sure what time okay, it is. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, but we'll find out in a few moments. I am joined today by Dr. Pro Dr. Uh, Professor Perry Elliott. And I met Perry 20-some mm, odd years ago um, through uh, a mutual friend and somebody we both respected immensely, Carolyn Biro, the founder of the Cardiomyopathy Association. It is currently a. September 10. And uh, we spent some time together on that side of the pond and on this side of the pond at many cardiac conferences over the years, including the summits. Um, and that's how long I've known Dr. Professor Perry. Professor Elliott, I've known Dr. Um, you're fine. So I wanted to welcome him to the broadcast and uh, have him tell us a little bit about what the last 20 years have been like for him. Um, it's gone past really quickly in some ways and really slowly in others. So, um, yeah, so to say it's early 90s, I suppose. Um, you know, I started in my journey in hokemology as a research fellow in uh, St. George's in London. And that, as you say, that's when um, I first met Karen and Biro at the um, so I wanted to welcome to the broadcast. Associations yeah. it was then. Tell us a little um, bit about what the last 20 and um, the, it's gone by quickly because, you know, it, that, that, those days seem really as if they were yesterday. You know, it was, it was a totally different era. We, we were discovering so much. Um, I think we were both sides of the, of the pond were getting a pretty rough deal. Uh, they were encountering people that didn't really know much about their disease. They weren't really getting very much in the way of treatment. Um, and I think, although we've still got a long way to go, I think it, it, it's totally different. Now. I think you know, knowledge is, is it's pretty widespread. We've now got, you know, you've worked really hard in the States to create special centers. And we've got the defibrillator, which we didn't have when, you know, when I started. It, then it was amiodarone or nothing. Um, some things, you know, haven't changed. I mean, in terms of drug therapy, that hasn't changed much. But, you know, we've just seen in the past couple of weeks, haven't we? You know, we have. maybe a new era in drug therapy. And, and, and I think for me, the past five years, is I've really started to, to develop an optimism about the future with drug therapy because cardiomyopathies of all kinds, including hydrocardiomyopathy, have been the Cinderella's as, as far as drug development is concerned. Some companies didn't see that there was any point in investing money in rare or uncommon disease, but that's totally transformed now. Yeah. You know, yes. you know, just go online and look at clinicaltrials.gov. You know, there's more than 200 trials in underway at the moment in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, gene therapy. This stuff is real now, you know, so I, I, you know, I don't know whether it's going to happen before I retire. But I, I think the next 10, 20 years is going to be a really exciting time. So oh, we just might have to push back that retirement a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so on top of being interested in being a hokemologist or however you want to call it, um, you also get a little bit more involved in what I've been referring to the past few years as HCM spectrum disorders. So diseases that kind of have the phenotypic expression of HCM, but have a different underlying cause. Uh, before we get into this penetrance document, which I'm really excited to talk to you about, um, can you just talk about some of the spectrum disorders that you've had an interest in over the years? Being interested in okay, so this is, so you, you know what this field is like. There's been lots of sort of debates amongst a small group of experts, and, and one of them, in a crazy way, is how do you define the condition? And the, what I've always done in the clinic is, is to describe what I see before me, you know, so I do an echo, do an MRI, whatever, the heart stick, microtrophic cardiomyopathy. The key thing is that for me is a starting point, it's not the end. And the starting point is, okay, well, what's causing that thickened heart? Okay, so maybe half of people have these mutations in sarcomere protein genes that we're going to be talking about tonight. But um, what did the other half have? They've still got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that's where you see these rare heart conditions. Now, you know, we've made a big deal about one in particular called Fabry's disease, which is maybe about 1% of people with HCM.
but it, it's, it's the same with any rare condition. You know, rare things are rare often because we don't look for them. Now, in the past, maybe that didn't matter so much, but you know, what I was just saying about development of specific therapy, you know, Fabrice has, a, has multiple therapies now. We're now seeing therapies for some of these other rarer genetic subtypes. Um, one of the really big ones in older people with thick hearts is amyloidosis, you know? So you know, you're, you're a man over the age of 70, you've got a thick heart, rare often. You know, you've got a pretty high chance of having amyloidosis. And once again, we've got drugs in what I was just saying about that may be able to slow disease progression. So it's, how can, that's a starting point, what we call phenocopies, these things that look really big ones, same, older people actually um, are not, and they've got very different natural histories and very different age. You're a man over the age of 70. So I've just gotten a off. notice from somebody you yeah, know named Amy told us we have a little bit of an those. echo. So we have. You've got a real big delay on what I've just been saying. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry so about that. I don't know if we have a technical I can, I can hear it. It's going on in the background. Can you hear it where you're sitting? No, I sound perfectly look. fine to me. Yeah, I've got quite a lot of echo too. Actually, I'm going to... Um, not, and um, play with the soundboard a little bit here and see sure. if I can't fix the sound a little bit. That could be better. Is that a little bit better? There's still a delay in there. It's amazing. It's, it's about 30 seconds, 40 seconds behind. Wow, that's yeah. pretty annoying. So I, I we're going to have to try to get through that part. Yeah, I don't know how to do technology. Um, and I'm hoping that the sound is a little bit better. Amy, if you can shoot me another text message, that would be really helpful. Um, and this is why we edit out for the podcast, because they won't have to hear this. It sounds perfectly fine on this side. So maybe if our audio isn't great through Facebook, it will be improved on the podcast. Um, so um, I'm sorry, I lost track of time there. But, you know, we're talking about spectrum disorders. And, you know, you've got the amyloid breakthroughs. You've got the Gannon's research going on. <laughs> And then we have, you know, breakthroughs with Navicampton and the utilization and those with new medications. So um, now let's let's dive into topic. And this way, hopefully, the delays will all catch up. And uh, at the end of the, the talk on the paper, still an echo from Wendy. This is great when everybody's watching and I've got this. I'm going to try to, you know, let's see. So it's not so annoying for people. And I'm going to try something. Is that any better? Sounds like we're in a washing machine, but yeah, that's <laughs> actually try, try speaking now. I've changed my microphone to a different microphone. So we've it, lost the echo. We've got there's a, there's a sort of strange little washing sound when you speak, but it's it to me it's better. Hold that thought. Carrie, keep some company for a moment. Talk about okay. something fun. <laughs> okay. So this is an interesting experience, isn't it? Having to talk, talk to myself now. But so this this point I've been just making about, about diagnosis, it's been an amazingly controversial issue because you know people like to categorize things, they like to put them into boxes. And people have been trying to force hypertrophic cardiomyopathy into one box, which is the sarcomere protein disease. But I've said we're defining a, a disease um, by something which is actually only true for less than half of people with the condition. So it doesn't really make much sense to me. So it's... It does not. Okay, we have fixed our echo problem. So um, I hope it's sounding better on your side as well. I've just changed my microphone. Uh, so this article that we're, that I reached out to you while you were on holiday. Um, I said, hey, I really want to discuss this one. Come on. And it took us a couple of weeks to get it organized. But the penetrance of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and sarcomere protein mutation carriers. That's a big name. And for our families and uh, diagnosed individuals who are not genetic geeks, um, can you break down what that title actually means? Yeah, sure. So, so penetrance just means that you're carrying a spending mistake in a gene and penetrance refers to whether or not there are any signs of that gene, either on an echo or an ECG. In other words, it's what we, when we say, is someone expressing the gene, that's what we mean. It means that they actually have the condition when we take a picture of a heart or when we do an electrocardiogram. If you carry the gene, 
but that all those tests are normal, then we say it's non-penetrant or it's not expressing. Um, so in this study, what we were looking at were family members that we'd screened. So we had a, you know, an index patient, we went to their relatives, we screened them, and we did genetic testing at the same time. And what, we, what we've done is to describe how many of them had evidence of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at the first time we saw them, and then how many of those relatives who were normal when we first saw them went on to develop the condition. Uh, because this has been one of the, the key unanswered questions in screening, actually. It's, you know, okay, I've screened 10 relatives. I've got four who've carried the mutation. Three of them look completely normal. What do you do with those people? Do you say, you're fine, go away. You say, come back in a year or three years or five years or 10 years. That, that we haven't really known what to do. So you took the opportunity to take a look at a number of families who came through your clinic and they were genotype positive, phenotype negative, so they had the gene, their hearts were still normal, and you followed them over how long a period of time? So it was out to 14 years. Um, so I think the average was around about eight years, something like that, but it was a mixed population. So we took both kids and adults. Um, so the, you know, the period that we recruited these people was from I think 1988 onwards, um, but it was, it was at that, at that sort of range, out to 15 years. Okay, and in this data, which I will um, provide a link after this technical problem has happened, uh, to the actual paper that is now on the HCMA website, so you can all get it and read it and probably come up with more questions after this. I probably should have published it before. Um, but so your, your aim was to identify how many of the genetically positives would actually convert to phenotype positive over what period of time? And yeah. this is a big deal question to families in this community. Yeah. What do you do with that information of genetic positive, but there's nothing else there? So walk us through the, the math and the logic of how you figured out who was who and, and what the numbers really showed. Okay, so um, we started off with, and it was about 580 relatives from about 300 families. And we did genetic testing and half of the people that we saw had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It was about 40, 45%. So we didn't make much of that in the paper actually. And it's what you'd expect from this kind of genetic disease. But you know, if you just do go out there, screen the relatives, half of them will have evidence of the disease as, as young as five years or even earlier. So, so that, that already sort of, it justifies the genetic testing because the yield is high, but it changes practice because we've been saying for some time now that, well, you know, is there any point in screening kids less than five or less than 10? Well, we're showing here actually, yeah, I mean, th this disease expresses much earlier than we, I think, than we've realized in the past. If you look at the other half, the other 55%, um, so we ended up with about 285 individuals from 156 families who didn't have anything on imaging. So their echo and MRIs were normal when we first evaluated them, but they carried the family genetic mutation and then, and then we followed them. Um, as you know, there, there's, there are a lot of sar what we call sarcomere genes. The sarcomere is this, this thing within all of our heart muscle cells that contracts and makes the heart move. And the proteins that make that up, it's the genes that make those proteins which cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And there are many of them, but there are two genes which accounted for, I think it was about 70% of all patients. There's one called uh, beta myosin heavy chain, another one called myosin binding protein C. Um, so we, we followed people for, for a median of about eight years, I say range, I can tell you actually, it was four to 13 years. And of those people who started off as normal, about 30% went on to develop evidence for the disease in terms of an abnormal echo or abnormal ECG. Um, you can break that down a, a, a little bit more because there were some who also just went from a normal ECG to an abnormal ECG. So they were expressing the disease, but when we took the picture, there still wasn't hypertrophy. So if you put those two groups together, it's about half of all those who started without disease had evidence for, for disease expression by the end of the follow-up period, which again is what you'd expect from 
from you know the odds of, of having disease but yeah you know, that's that's a lot of people who go on to develop disease it is. Yeah. Now, one thing we were interested in was because the, the counter argument is that, yeah, okay, okay, fine. But all these people, they're, they're, they're fine. Okay, so they've got a funny ECG. Yeah, maybe they've got a little bit of thickening, but there's nothing wrong with them. But I think what we've shown is that as, as when you have no expression of disease, so if your echo is normal, not very much happens to you. You don't develop you know, complications. But as soon as you start expressing the disease, as soon as that hypertrophy appears, then you become potentially prone to all the things that we know can happen when you have hypertrophic tonopathy. And that's really the justification for, I think, long-term screening. Um, we did identify there were some predictors. So I say not everybody went on to de develop a disease, but the guys developed it more than the women. So if you're a male, you're more likely to go on to develop disease. Um, if your ECG was abnormal at the beginning, with a normal echo, then again, you were far more likely to go on to develop disease. Um, there wasn't interestingly much difference between the genes. That surprised me. Um, I, I tortured the fellow that did this, <laughs> did this study on a couple of things, and that was one of them, because in the past, we thought that some of the genes were fully expressed by your early 20s, maybe mid 20s to 30s. But actually, the disease expression for all but one of the genes just continues throughout life. And, it, and it's, you know, it's, it's linear for all of them. There wasn't really that much difference between them. If there was any difference after about 15 years, it was one of the genes, uh, beta myosin, that tended to have a slightly higher expression than the others. But we, we didn't see what that, that same pattern that we've seen in the past. You know, it doesn't really matter what the gene is, you've got the same risk of developing disease. So there's a couple of items in this article. I, you know, I like to get into the details and um, a couple of things I thought were fascinating. Um, I'm not so sure that they're going to be life changers for anybody doing right now, but I think there are possibilities for future exploration. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them you, you touched on um, about these abnormal EKGs up front, but on the other side, there's this other small group yeah. They have normal EKGs and abnormal yeah. imaging through CMR, through MRI, not just through echo. So these are people who are going to hide if we're only doing echo screening and not doing MRIs. It's a small number of the total, but there is clinical presentation that we can't see with the current imaging of an echo. So what, what does that mean to you in yeah. terms of practice? So there were two tests. There. So the, the, uh, my favorite test is the ECG because it's, I think it's a really sensitive marker. And in hypertrophic thermopathy, as I say, that's the first thing that becomes abnormal. It becomes abnormal before an echo and MRI. The number we've been trotting out for 30 years um, is about 5% of people with hypertrophic thermopathy have a normal ECG. This study suggests actually it's a bit higher than that. So, so the ECG alone um, is not sufficient as a screening tool when you're looking at relatives and I think that's a really important practice point you know it's quite sensitive but it, it, it's not entirely specific it doesn't rule out the disease and then you've got the second thing is that yeah you can have an, an apparently normal echo and yet when you do the MRI you find hypertrophy and there's a picture in the, in the paper of that of an example of that and that's because there are some parts of the heart that are difficult to image with the ultrasound. That's the picture. Yeah. So if you look at that top left-hand corner, then, you know, that on an echo, that that's near where the lungs sit when you do an ultrasound, and that interface is really hard to see. Um, sometimes down at the apex in some people, the tip of the ventricle, that can be a little difficult to see on an echo. So it's the classic areas that we know are difficult to image, um, which you can actually only ever see on an MRI, really. So, so I think everybody should have an MRI at least some point during their screening. And that's that's great news. We, you know, I think MRI leads a lot of gives us a lot of information to work off of. Not only true measurements of the heart, but allows us to see scarring. And I think there's some great value there. Did you notice any LGE burden in this population, or did you look at LGE? Uh, it's a really good question. I think we did look at that. But um, the LGEs, I can't give you a number for it. We didn't put that in the paper. Um, but the LGE tends to track with the severity of hypertrophy. 
So the more hypertrophy you have, the more likely you're going to develop a bit of gout. More algae. Yeah, yeah. So for a lot, most of these people that were expressing the disease were expressing it with relatively mild hypertrophy. So we were catching them relatively early in the, yeah. in the trajectory. So I, there wasn't that much much gout. So that was my one first interesting moment. I'm not sure what to do with that, but it's interesting, and I think I think you should keep working on that and go get that fellow back on it. Um, but the next part that I had my aha moment on, because this is a big conversation for our community, you know, risk versus symptoms. People think if they're not symptomatic, they're not at risk for something bad happening. And that seems to be, a, you know, a reasonable expectation, but not with HCM. Symptoms does not equal risk. And in this population, those who were gene positive, had no evidence of disease, didn't have any bad things happen, no cardiac arrest, no arrhythmias, no bad things. But those who did convert mm -hmm. over this time period, some of them were pretty significant. There was a number of deaths here of relatively young people, yep. inappropriate shocks, uh, there's all kinds of weird stuff going on here. So why don't we talk about some of the outcomes, the negative outcomes that we've seen in this population that went from I'm asymptomatic and just genotype positive to I really have HCM. Yeah. So, you know, we talked a lot uh, at the beginning about expression of disease. So that's CCG changes, that's echo changes, but it's also the development of your risk, if you like, you know, the, the, the uh, propensity of the heart muscle to, to develop arrhythmias. And that, that's part of the expression as well. Um, and as you say, there's obviously people with some people with hypertrophic polymorphy will develop symptoms of chest pains or breathlessness or blackouts, maybe palpitations and irregular heart rhythms. Um, and often when I'm talking to people about risk, they say, and you know, we talk about an ICD, they say, well, yeah, I don't want an ICD at the moment, but um, I, I'll wait until I get symptoms, you know, until I get a warning sign. And unfortunately, that isn't always the case. In fact, it's very rare. So. Yeah, the, the risks of sudden cardiac death are not dependent on your symptoms. Yeah, they're dependent on a number of other things, whether it be the severity of the thickening or arrhythmias on a tape, which are usually not symptomatic, um, your family history and yeah, the gene you're carrying may be a particularly high risk one. None of these things are necessarily directly related to the symptoms that you have. So when I'm talking to people about hypertrophic chemotherapy, I tend to sort of put the, the issues into three boxes. You know, we talk about the fact that this is a genetic disease and everything that goes with that. What does that mean for your family? You know, if you're going to screen people, what does that mean for life insurance, you know, your occupation, blah, 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 all that stuff. Then I talk about the risk and, you know, these are the things, this is the way in which we, we think we identify the high risk patient. And if we think you're a high risk, this is what we can do about it. And then I talk about the symptoms. And of course, there's, a, there's some links between all those things, but there are three quite different conversations. They are. And it, it's complicated to get people to understand the disconnect. And I'm hoping that if we keep talking about it, people will, will hear us that waiting for that first symptom sometimes isn't a good thing. But on the converse side of that, and I know this is something we've had many conversations about over the years, is when is there enough risk to take the risk of getting an ICD? Yeah. And there's some really difficult balancing points in there that are complex and evolving and have been for the 20 some odd years that we've been having these conversations. Um, but in that time, and now what we know, does the MRI help us in this regard more than we thought it would? And mm. are gonna add that to the ESC risk score analysis? So there are so <laughs> many questions packaged up in that. <laughs> Um, okay, so let me deal with the MRI thing first of all, because like, when I'm also, I nearly always ask that question when we're talking about risk, and I think it's because yeah. I'm sitting with this sort of anti-MRI person. And no, I'm no, not, no, 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 just, it's I'm evolving. Not, I'm not going to admit to either way on, on Facebook, but okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, MRI has a, one big advantage over echo, maybe two, we talked about the its ability to see bits of the heart that maybe echo doesn't always see. So that's a tick. But the, the major thing it brings to the table is that it can look at scar, which 
you know you can sort of see on echo but but mri is a much more precise quantitative tool for measuring skull right. so it makes absolute sense that you know if you if you if you look at the heart muscle why why do people have cardiac arrests why, why is the heart twitchy well sometimes it's because it's scarred you know you, you get these arrhythmias arising from the edge of the scar so it must be telling us something about the vulnerability of that person's heart to have a cardiac arrest the, the thing you know there's a very strange thing we do in medicine we're always looking for the test that tells you everything it, it, over and every generation invents its own test so you ask me you know, what's changed over 20 years if you go back to when i started out we didn't have mris we had M we had echoes but they weren't great so we had ecgs we had angiograms you know so so we did lots of cats and we did lots of so-so echoes we did lots of ecg tests um, and then we did a bit of nuclear stuff and then we did and then we're doing mris and, and yeah, god knows what will be around the corner next some some new technique and every generation thinks that that is the test that tells me everything it's more complicated than that you know you you can't describe a complex condition like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a single number yeah. um, and you know what? It's the same for diabetes. It's the same for coronary disease. It's the same for hypertension. We we're we're, we're quite simplistic as cardiologists. <laughs> put it in the box of hypertension. Put it in the box of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's more complicated, but it it's maybe not. I, I don't want to make it too complicated. And, I, and actually, I think the amazing thing I'm still after all this time amazed is that if I look back when I started out two, three times a year, I'd get a phone call saying one of our patients had died suddenly and you think, Jesus, I didn't expect that. That doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't happen anymore. And it's- I, I'm gonna argue with you on that. We, I, I've seen it happen a couple of times. It has a couple, I mean, you know, but yeah. in terms of, I mean, because we, then we saw hundreds of patients, now we see thousands of patients, you know? It is a rare occurrence today. It's a rare occurrence today. And now why is that? Well, because we have the defibrillator, but that's not the only reason. It's not the only reason. I actually think that we can identify the overwhelming majority of people who are at risk. The problem is the one where you started, which is not, can you identify the high risk patient? It's what is acceptable risk? That's yeah. a really, really tough thing. And it's one that, you know, uh, most doctors, I don't want to disparage my, my, my profession, but the, but we actually, don't think about that very often. What is acceptable risk? Because there's no definition of acceptable risk. Yeah, what do we what do we do in guidelines? So that you know, the, the last iteration of the Hope and guidelines, we you know, there's a there's a figure I'm sure you know it well where you know we say we use our tool more than six percent put an ICD in less than four percent you don't, and then there's a zone in between where you maybe. Where do those numbers come from? wondered that myself for a long time and I think I've asked you that well you know yeah I can tell you it wasn't <laughs> Moses you know on the 11th tablet who came down <laughs> the mountain and said thou shalt put an ICD in a patient with more than 6% I tell you it's 20, 20, 20 guys and one woman sitting around a table saying well what do you think uh, 8% uh, 6% uh, 5% and I can tell you there was a huge range in what the cardiologists around the table would accept some thought that five percent was was you know far too uh, lenient. Oh no, I wouldn't. I want one percent. And other people saying no, ten percent. It's got to be at least ten percent. And, and you know, as an exercise, if if you if you compare different diseases, like tropic cardiomyopathy versus dilated cardiomyopathy versus long QT syndrome, if you actually look at the risk thresholds that people use to make decisions, they're totally different. They're totally different. Um, a colleague of mine in the UK years and years ago did it. He, I don't think he ever published it. He, did it. he surveyed electrophysiologists, so, you know, cardiologists who specialize in the electrics and putting devices in to assess. You know, a simple question what, what is your acceptable risk? You know, what's the threshold above which you might consider putting an ICD in? And it came, actually came out about 1% per year, um, which is similar to what. So when I talk about 5%, that's 5% in five years. Um, but there was a direct correlation between the age of the electrophysiologist and, their, and the risk they would accept. And younger electrophysiologists would accept 
they wouldn't accept any risk. Whereas the older ones would accept more risk because they'd seen a lot more and they, they know the bad stuff that can happen uh -huh. when you do things to people. You know, when you put an ICD yeah. in, if you're operating someone, the complications are fortunately not that common, but they do happen. And, and you know, as you know very well, but ICDs have, have transformed their ability to protect people. But if you have an ICD for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, you may have risks later on in your life. So risk it's a very, very, very interesting question. This is what is an acceptable risk. And going back to the original question, um, <laughs> <laughs> I got away with that. <laughs> it was good try, But I, I know you guys put a great deal of work and effort and and analytics behind the ESC risk score, I would just think it would be more powerful if we could put some data regarding MRI and LGE and risk factor there. Okay, so the issue, the issue there is that um, because event rates are low, yeah, so if, if you take all comers now, with heart traffic coming off, the, the incidence of um, sudden death or an ICD shock, so put them all in the same basket, is less than 1% per year. It's about 0.6% per year. So if you want to create a clever algorithm, a clever tool to predict risk, you've got to have a hell of a lot of people followed for a very long time. So you need more data on MRI before we can quantify it enough. Because you know the, the risk tool we generated was generated from 1988 onwards. Right. And we just didn't have the longitudinal data. I am you know, obviously aware of the, um, the current MRI study that's taking place at the moment, the multi-center study. Yeah. What, what's very interesting about that is that that um, ran for five years um, uh, and they didn't have enough events. Right. You know, what, what, they, what they saw was atrial fibrillation, but they didn't have enough events. And that's why, actually, I think refining with new tools, if you want to come up with a new marker of sudden death, it's going to actually be really hard to build that into a tool for that for that reason. But you know, I, this is a really dangerous thing to say. I'm not sure we really need to, because I think the, as I said, it, I think it's it's you're never going to get everybody. I think any doctor that says you can say you can identify everybody who's at risk is a bit of a fibber. Does that is that does that translate into American? Yes. It, it, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean something else because you know we're, we're separated by a common language. It's not something exactly. else. No, fibbers, fibbers are fibbers. Yeah. Okay, no, it's not. It's nothing obscene. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say anything. Very <laughs> so you're never going to save everybody, and of course, you know, when you look at the at the zero risk factor, the patient who nothing. Of course, you're going to see a few people that drop dead suddenly. But you know, often we don't know why they died. You know, just because someone died suddenly doesn't mean they died from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They may have died with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy but not necessarily from it so you know there is there is a you could say well they just put an ICD in everybody yeah that's, that's the closest awesome. <laughs> that's the closest you're ever going to get to be able to protect you but but we know that people die suddenly with ICDs in for the really, same yeah. really but it's for the same reason you know you may occlude your, 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 your one of your main coronary arteries you may have a pulmonary embolus you may you know it, People still die suddenly. You can't stop everybody. So, so I think, yeah, we keep on trying to improve things. But actually, for me, the emphasis on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Another thing, you, you know, you asked me what's changed over twenty years. Mm -hmm. For me, the emphasis is shifting has, has shifted towards the prevention of heart failure. You know, because you know, people live a long time with this condition now—20, 30, 40 years. And what happens is this is this is a muscle disease. I, I don't I, I don't know in your in the in your community, but, but we don't we don't use the words heart failure very often in the conversation with people. No. Um, but you know, if your breath is going upstairs, you've got heart failure. Mm -hmm. But you can have that for 20, 30 years. Yep. It's not the same as someone that's had a big heart attack or whatever. Um, but that to me is is the big challenge is how do we stop that muscle from deteriorating over time getting too rigid or getting weak or getting too stiff yeah all that stuff yeah. um that for me is that, that that's the next big frontier well there are two frontiers i think that's one and the second one where it's a little glimmer of hope now is 
wouldn't it be great if you took all these people in this paper with a mutation who don't have hypertrophy and you can stop them from developing it? Wouldn't that be sexy? That would be awesome. I'll take two of those, thank you. Um, <laughs> that would be great. So we've, we're kind of a little off the paper here, so I'm gonna bring us back to the paper. <laughs> we can do some Q&A in a few minutes, so if people have questions, they can start populating the Facebook page and I will eventually try to get back to there because I'm still multitasking with three different screens here. Um, and we are going to have to do a re-record or pull it from here for the podcast because of the audio issue, but that's a whole other story. So I want to talk about this male prevalence thing in this paper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because as I'm reading this, I'm going, but why do women have more heart failure later in life? And where are they in here? And I get to the next line and you're like, but women have more heart failure later. So we don't understand where the disconnect is. Is it possible that men and women develop the signs of HCM differently? And we're not able to see the earlier signs in women because of some gender-based difference. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, this, this male-female difference is seen in many different diseases across, you know, and many different cardiac diseases. And um, in cardiomyopathies, we, it, in virtually all cardiomyopathies, there's a male predominance. Um, although, interestingly, in one called arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, we've, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of women being diagnosed with it over the past 10 years. So actually there's a female predominance in that that's emerged in that. So there's there's all sorts of theories why this might be. I mean, if, if, if it may be the biology of the heart's different. So, you know, the effect of female hormones, the disappearance of those with the menopause, maybe that delays or modifies the expression of the condition with time. Um, there may be some social aspect to this. Um, so maybe there's bias or unconscious bias in the assessment of women's symptoms. Um, maybe women experience them or express their symptoms in a totally different way. So you know, maybe they're complaining of chest pain in the same way as men complain of chest pain. Um, yeah, uh, there's, it, it's, it's a really interesting area and there's a myriad of possibilities. But for me, I think it, all those things might be true, but I think there is probably something different about the biology of the Hokum heart in men and women on average. Um, I mean, I think it, women tend to take longer to get to heart failure, but they, the hearts in older women tend to be maybe not as thick, but they're stiffer and they may be a bit more fibrotic than the guys' hearts. Um, something else which we've never really got to grips with is, is how we make the diagnosis in the first place. You know, because normal ranges for male hearts are not the same for normal ranges for female hearts. Well, maybe we're, we use a single number. Maybe we should be using different numbers to diagnose the condition in men and women. You know, yeah. the for hypertrophy. Um, but it, yeah, yeah. But it, but this difference is, is definitely there. I mean, it's it's too easy to say. Oh, well, it's hormones. You know, it's the hormones. <laughs> it may be it may be hormones, but it but it's. I think it, there may be some other fundamentals about you know, the biology of, of male and female hearts. So I I go back to my genetic joke about men and women. You know, X X X Y. You know, you guys just are deficient of so much programming. That maybe you know something in that little piece that broke off would be helpful. Just think, um, just think what we pack onto that little white crimson. <laughs> we could create a whole human body for what's on the little <laughs> So I, there, there's definitely some gender differences, and um, you know, if I were to look at the overall HCM constituency of you know, fifteen thousand families over twenty years, and 45, 50,000 individuals that we, we have connection with, we do have a higher transplant rate in women versus men. Interesting. Um, I didn't even realize it until we just really started collecting the data and looked at it. And it's probably two to one mm. for our, our constituents. And now they may be more uh, you know engaged with advocacy and we may know them because they're sicker or what have you. But most of our transplants are going to women. And it's not just in the United States, it's all over the world. So that's really kind of interesting as to why are we transplanting so much? Do we not complain enough? Do men complain more about their symptoms and get more attention? Or is there something else? I'm going to go with the something else because I think complaints are pretty equal. I mean, maybe I say maybe all of the above, but I, but I think there is some, something about the biology. The other thing which we, 
is another paper which I'll be very happy to come back and discuss. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're invited anytime you want to talk. Just send me a paper, we'll set up a date, we'll talk. Okay. Um, we published it earlier this year in JAMA Cardiology, um, and that was looking at the uh, mortality in HOCA populations across different European countries against the background in the normal population. So we corrected it for the standardized mortality in Italy, Germany, Spain, France, and so on. Overall mortality in the Hokan population, as I say, is low. But there is still an excess for your age-matched peers. And that excess is greater for women than it is for men. So within that small range, you know, women are actually at higher risk of sudden death than, than men compared to the, the background in the general population. And the other thing that we saw was that the excess risk sort of declines as you get older. And in men, by the time you reach 60, then your background risk is, your, your risk of dying suddenly is very similar to the background risk in the general population. But in women, the risk remains high above the age of 60. So it's not just in, and we don't know why people are dying. So it could be some of the heart failure stuff. It could be sudden deaths. But the, but the mortality rates compared to the normal population are not the same in men and women. So we know that there's disparities in healthcare in terms of gender and you know even geographic location, et cetera. Are we doing enough in HCM to overcome these issues or should we be doing more to be more granular on some of these particular gender-based issues? Um, I think um, I think there is increasing awareness. I think, I mean, if 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 there is a bias, if there is a gender bias in the people doing the studies, that's that's changing really quickly. <laughs> I think in the studies we're we're pretty equally represented, but is, is yeah. there a need for you know HCM women's research because it was his, yeah. you know if you go back historically it was thought of to be a man's disease up front yeah and it took years for people to get that out of their head i remember being told myself as you know a 20 year old oh women don't get hcm that, or ihss that's a man's disease and i'm like um nope it's right here yeah exactly um i think there is i mean i think it's the things the things we're talking about is actually dis whenever we do a study looking at the characteristics of the disease or its epidemiology we should be i think more consciously thinking about is there a gender difference here yeah. uh, i think also actually looking at therapy you know i mean yeah do, do women get the same benefit from any intervention that men do we don't know we don't know um i think in the in the, re in the recent mother campton trial i think it was the same um that it didn't appear to be a gender difference but we should that that should be something that we we start thinking about maybe a little bit more deliberately in, in papers that we, we publish in this, in this disease. So for everybody who's interested, I just posted to the Facebook page the link to the article, which is on the HCMA website, so you can pull that up now. Um, and you can dig into the data, and we're happy to respond to questions after we're live as well. Um, so what was my other question on here? So I want to go to the, to the real take-home message, the conclusions of this particular paper. So what do you think? And then we have some questions that we're going to address. So what is your take home out of all of the research you did? So I think, so the key take home message is if you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you should seriously consider getting your relatives, your first few relatives screened and that genetic testing should be available. Um, if you have a relative who has a genetic test, carries the same mutation, but their echo and or ECG are normal, that individual should be routinely reassessed um, at intervals which depend partly on what you see at the baseline. So if they've got an abnormal ECG, I would probably see them on a yearly basis. If the ECG is normal, maybe two or three yearly. Um, and I would, um, if someone has got an abnormal ECG, closer surveillance, if they're male, closer surveillance. But I would always try to get an MRI at the baseline evaluation. And maybe at some point during follow-up, two years, three years, something like that. I think they're, 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 they're the main points, I think. And when should they consider an MRI in that screening? So if it's, it's possible, if it's possible, I would do it at the first test. So I think if someone is, if, if it's a relative who's got a positive genetic test, I would do the MRI at that point. 
and then again at an interval maybe two or three years later. UK systems are a little different than US-based systems and other countries are even more different than that. You guys need a national health system. <laughs> We got to do something, that's for sure. Because if anything has become completely apparent in the past nine months here, um, is we need better structure, better communication, better redundancies. We need a lot. In the meantime, while the country is fixing the system, I'm just going to worry about the little HCM population and make sure we have centers of excellence available as many as possible. Um, I'm doing my part. So um, I, I think we have challenges to get MRIs and we need payers to understand the value of MRI to this population, not necessarily for disease management, but for screening as well. Yeah. So I think these are really critical um, infrastructure issues. I'm gonna go to some questions now. Okay. Um, I'm having a little bit of an issue with my um, my screens here. So I'm going back and forth between the phone. Mm -hmm. um, Stephanie, and Amy say hello. They just want to make sure that you know that they're here. Um, so uh, that's good. Um, and Susie wants to say hi. It's been a few years since she saw you at Bart's. Um, so there's all the, the pleasantries out of the way. Um, and that's the old one. There's some echoes. Yes, we fixed that problem. That's a long time ago. So the gender issues were a big question on here that we have addressed. Um, and somebody just mentioned that they can't get their MRI approved for their insurance. Well, maybe articles like this one will be of assistance to put in for an appeal. And if you're a member of the HCMA, we can assist you in writing that appeal. They take a lot of time, so we do ask for membership for that. We have scholarship memberships available if it's a money issue, but we need to put some resources behind that. Um, so what else do we have here? Inappropriate shocks are a big emotional burden. Yes, you're right. And some misinformation. If there's any other questions here, do you, Okay, I'm not even sure what the, how you're wording this. Do non-obstructive cardio? Okay, that's the question. Obstructed versus non-obstructed patients, who does better long-term? Okay. Um, it seems like such an easy question. But it isn't really. Um, so if you look at obstruction, this, this is what um, one of those big debating points, wasn't it? You know, is obstruction related to a higher risk of sudden death or not? Um, and I think all the evidence would suggest now that it, it it's one of those things you take into account when you're assessing someone's risk. So having obstruction does increase the risk. Although if that's the only thing you have, so if, you, if your thickness is not that great, if you don't have any arrhythmias, if your MRI is normal, all, all that stuff, and all you have is obstruction, then the increasing risk is not that great. Um, the severity of the gradient also tracks to some degree with risk. So, so it's it's part of the mix when you're assessing someone's risk of sudden cardiac death. But people with and without obstruction can still be at high risk of sudden death. So, so you have to individualize the assessment. And if you're non-obstructive, it doesn't mean you're at low risk from sudden death. Um, I think if you have someone who's non-obstructive, who has a lot of symptoms, then they tend to be the people that we've been talking about actually quite a lot this evening. People are maybe on that, that track of developing slow, but maybe progressive dysfunction of their heart muscle. And, and it, it's that group where I think the focus is in, increasing, um, you know, all centers, US and UK and Europe, um, because it, it does tend to be progressive. You, know, you get slow thinning of the muscle, the heart muscle tends to get stiffer with time. You start to get more scar. So the long-term problems with non-obstructive, perhaps are more heart failure related, but the sudden death issue is across both groups. Can we address low ejection fraction at HCM? So non-obstructed, the EF is dropped to 50 or lower. Yeah. How do we send these straight to a transplant pathway or what do we do with these patients? Okay, so um, I'm sure most of the people listening on this have you know, they see their letters and so they see this number, the ejection fraction. So the ejection fraction, if that's your heart muscle, there's a difference between that and that, <laughs> as it beats. So the heart beats uh, usually around 50% of its content with each heartbeat. So a normal ejection fraction is 50% or 55 or more. People with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy typically have very high ejection fractions. And a mistake we've, we've 
we've made in the past, I've made in the past, to say that people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have supranormal function, because it's the ejection fraction is 80%. That's not actually true. It's because the heart is really small and it doesn't have to move very much to eject its contents. So ejection fraction of 75% is normal, but over time it sort of goes 75, 65, 55, and then suddenly it gets to 50 and everybody goes, oh, there's a problem. But actually it's been going on for quite a long time. Now, if it's less than 50%, then generally that means that they're there is some significant loss in contractile function. But your question about do we send people for transplant? No, because I think that's, that depends on whether the patient has symptoms, how compensated it is, because it does tend to be a very slow, insidious thing. But if you see someone injection for 50% or 45%, that the paradigm in the mind should change for, on the part of their cardiologist saying, okay, well, this, this person may be at risk of developing heart failure. It may be not too far distant future, so I need to keep a closer eye on them with regular echoes and so on. Okay. Um, so we, we're getting a few interesting questions in here. So is persistent atrial fibrillation going to make hokum worse over time? Um, so it tracks, so it, atrial fibrillation is, is, one, is a prognostic marker. So if you have AF, then you tend to do less well if you don't have AF. Now, is it the AF that's causing that, or is it just the fact that it's telling you your heart's already quite a long way down the, 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 the line in terms of deterioration? And I think it's probably the latter, actually. Um, atrial fibrillation, it relates in overwhelming majority of people to the size of the atrium, you know, the top chamber of the heart. If your atrium is small, very rarely do you get atrial fibrillation. But as it gets bigger and bigger, you become more prone. And it's getting bigger and bigger because yeah, you've had 20 years of that atrium trying to force blood into a, into a thickened heart muscle cavity and it, it stretches up and when it gets to, there's a magical, there's lots of magical numbers in medicine, five centimeters, okay, when it gets to five centimeters, then the risk of, of developing atrial fibrillation takes off. So, so I think it's associated with disease progression. Um, by itself, it probably doesn't promote disease progression unless it's really, really rapid and poorly controlled. And, and that's one of the, you know, as, as long as you can slow the heart rate down or get someone back into sinus rhythm, but keeping the heart rate down is a good thing to do um, in, in terms of its management. So AFib is not good, but it's not the end of the world. It can it's not the end of the world. You can live with AFib. Lots of people live with AFib. Yeah. So can we discuss what causes restrictive filling? And HCM. Okay, that's another one that, that, that the argument about that one goes back to even, even before I was born, I think. So, <laughs> so what it means, um, so we, we talk loosely about stiff hearts, okay? So, so basically, here's your heart muscle, blood comes into it. Now, if when the blood comes in, the pressure shoots up, that's restrictive filling. What it means is the ventricle has, can't, it can't accommodate that blood. You know, if you put blood into a normal ventricle, it, it expands. But in a, in a small Hogan ventricle, the blood comes in and that heart's not going to expand. And so it just pushes the pressure up. That's what we mean by restrictive filling. Okay, I think we're getting to the bottom of some of these questions here. And I have two different sorting mechanisms that I can do these by. Um, inherited IHSS. We call it HCM now. We don't call it IHSS anymore. You know, they all, some of those old docs still use it. Um, I think we've got most of these guys addressed. If anybody else has any questions. Oh, there's a few more here. Sorry. Is it safe to do low intensity exercise? Ah, the exercise question. Yeah. Yeah. The exercise question. So I think, again, think how that's evolved over the past 20 years. That, that advice. So the general principle is yes. But the exercise, I, I always regard exercise as being a prescription almost. So you, you, know, you have to individualize the advice. So you assess a person's symptoms, you assess their risk, you assess their, the function and anatomy of the heart, whether there's obstruction or no obstruction, and then you tailor the advice to what you see. I think what has changed is that it's not, if, you, if you're low risk, you have no symptoms, you know, you've got what majority of people with this condition have, which is a low, form, a, a low risk disease then low intensity exercise is not forbidden. And in fact, it's probably encouraged. 
because you know if the worst thing you can do if you've got a heart condition is to sit there in your chair you know eating pretzels and not moving because mm -hmm. because you know you get all the bad stuff that happens to you when you're unfit and all the rest of it so keeping fit is important but it's it, it's mostly about common sense and i think about an open discussion about the knowns and the unknowns you know ultimately you know so can i prescribe a particular I mean, level of exercise you know, we, we had these mantras yeah you, know, you must have heard them many times you know don't do competitive exercise or yeah you know, here's a list of sports that are safe here's a list of sports that are not safe we have no idea we have no idea <laughs> Can sense it. <laughs> yeah, and, they, and, they, debate. and they always put cricket on as a low intensity exercise because no American understands cricket. So, you know. <laughs> you got me on that one. I, not, I don't think I've actually sat through a game, whatever you call it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so, as you know, there's some interesting days. I mean, you know, Charlie Day's uh, work, you know, taking yeah. people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that have ICDs in and actually doing a randomized trial, putting some into an exercise program and some to usual care. Nothing bad happens to those that exercise. They just feel better and they're fitter. So it's, exercise by itself is not a bad thing, but you, but you, it is really important to individualize the advice. Yeah, I mean, burst activities for certain obstructive patients might be problematic because you have blood flow issues and you can pass it out. Right, so yeah. these decisions need to be made in concert with a knowledgeable HCM expert and a patient willing to hear both sides of the story and not just be, I'm going to do this without listening to what the doctor's input is. There are safety issues that can be put into place, but I also think as we always bring up the exercise issue, looking at a child versus an adult are two separate things. Totally. I mean, you try and stop a child running around. I mean, it's... Um... I mean, I mean, you know, you may not, you may start with playing competitive sport, and I think that's that's, I mean, slightly tangential, but that's that's one of the justifications for screening children in that you can make some serious life decisions before they go on and want to play professional football or baseball. Right. Right. I need to be told when they're nineteen or twenty. Do you know what? You can't do this. You know, life destroyed. So. So you can make those kind of decisions. But, you know, again, one of those things that we don't talk about enough, it, look at what people are doing when they do die suddenly. They're asleep or doing mild exercise. You know, most events, two thirds of the events happen when people are not doing exercise. Um, another legend, which we've got to get rid of, I think it, it's, we're getting rid of it slowly, is that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the commonest cause of, of um, sudden death in young athletes. It isn't. It's actually quite uncommon. Well, common versus uncommon is relative. So if you look at, so if you look at the cardiomyopathies, it's arrhythmogenic right trigger cardiomyopathy, which is a common one. You know, it's- There's still a regional difference in that data. So the data, if you look at, Contemporary series. See, we've got a controversy. We have a controversy going on. Oh, <laughs> controversy. <laughs> you know, I'm the one from Jersey, and you're the one who wants to fight all the time. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> so, if you look at most um, contemporary series, then hypertrophic, the, the, the slice of the pie of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has been shrinking. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, why is that? Well, you could argue that it's better screening, maybe. Maybe some of those people are being taken out. That would be the argument that would be used in Italy, for example. So the number of deaths from hope in Italy is vanishingly low. But they would argue that's because they have compulsory screening, blah, blah, blah. Perhaps. Um, some of the early series, they weren't really epidemiological studies. They were report, they were sort of report based deaths that happened. And the deaths that were being reported were the thick hearts and the ARVCs were being missed. So, so it, it, it is a tricky one. I'm not saying that hokum cannot kill you during sport. So I'm not <laughs> saying that. But what I'm just saying is that- I think the national number here in the United States in current times, is probably about 25 per year. Okay. Out of, out of 325 million. So 
in in the data that I have seen, it's yes, it's it's a rare way to die. But when it happens, it catches the headline and and it becomes a much larger story because a young fit person died and oh, it's that HCM thing again. Um, so you see that commonality there and. For the United States population, it's often an African American male athlete. Absolutely, absolutely, and that, that, that could take us off on another really interesting discussion as to why that should be. Um, but the um, but the point I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that there, yeah, this legend has grown up about hypertrophic commonality that sport is absolutely forbidden and must not be done, and it comes from exactly that experience you've described. It's the prime time. TV, okay, you know, guy who drives on, dies on, on the pitch and he's got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That must mean that everybody with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is at the same risk. And it isn't that way. That's all I'm, that's all I'm saying. Okay, so for those of you tuning in 20 years late, um, <laughs> I'm gonna go backwards and say that um, there have been some um, animated and passionate discussions on some of these issues over the years. And um, my current guest, um, Perry Elliott, has, has been um, engaged in those conversations many times over the years, and I've been witness to some of them. Um, they're, the great part about HCM is we have a really amazing group of physicians. It's a small group. It's kind of like a family because you, you can fight with each other and then collaborate with each other on something else. And you can disagree because that pushes the ball forward. And that makes us all better at the end of the day. Sometimes it makes us a little angry at the moment or a little concerned, but eventually we get to something better. And that's the entire goal here is to work collaboratively, to work internationally, to come up with these hard questions and get real, honest, factual, good answers. And I think sometimes the answers start as consensus thought, consensus opinion, validated data, and then we get to the real answer, which sometimes isn't where we thought it was going to start, and it moves on. And we're in an evolution, and I'm grateful for that evolution. And these types of conversations are going to assist us in moving things forward. And I, I welcome Terry back anytime to talk about any article and have these discussions. And I'm going to, when we get off the live thing, I'm going to talk to you about another little project we're working on and we're going to recruit him in to help on that one. So we're going to keep this conversation going. Um, I am going to thank you all for viewing today. We had some really good questions and some good dialogue. Sorry about the audio problems early on. Um, but we figured that out. So thank you for all those who fed back to me that there were feedback issues. So we will put the note on the file that we cleared it up by about minute six. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Elliot or Professor Elliot. And uh, we do hope to have you back here for further discussion and more. So we're gonna end the live broadcast in...